Boy, Neil Gorsuch. I'm, I'm like, I've heard that name before. Where have I heard that name? I mean, you know, like in my lifetime, in my memory. Um, turns out it wasn't Neil. It was his mother, Anne, that I was remembering. I was trying to, and, and, you know, you can't, you know, trash somebody because of what their mother did. And, and besides that, she was a, a two pack a day smoker. So she died of cancer in her uh, late fifties, early sixties. But um, her mom was the guy, was the, the person, the woman who, who Ronald Reagan put in charge of the EPA in 1981 when he became president, you know, with the specific mission of taking it apart and, you know, which produced uh, some pretty startling, I mean, no, she slashed the EPA's budget by 22%. She aggressively rolled back uh, the clean water rules, the clean air rules, um, this is, this is, you know, uh, what a House staffer uh, to back, you know, this was back in 1983 said. In the first year of the Reagan administration, there was a 79% decline in the number of enforcement cases filed from regional offices to EPA headquarters and a 69% decline in the number of cases filed from the EPA to the Department of Justice. In other words, she, you know, basically just kind of, you know, treated the EPA pretty badly. Uh, Gorsuch was only a teenager at the time you know, when his mom became head of the EPA. Uh, but uh, this, this from a piece by uh, Dennis Bra uh, Brady Dennis and Chris Mooney in the Washington Post today. By the end of her stint at EPA, Ann Gorsuch was under siege. A half a dozen congressional committees were looking into allegations of mismanagement of the Superfund program. The House voted to cite her for contempt of Congress for failing to turn over subpoenaed records, the first such charge ever faced by a White House cabinet member. New York Times editorial in 93 said, quote, Ann Gorsuch inherited one of the most efficient and capable agencies in government. She has turned it into an Aegean stable reeking of cynicism, mismanagement, and decay. Reagan actually forced her to step down. She wrote rather bitterly about this, by the way, in her, um, in her uh, autobiography, Are You T Tough Enough, her 1986 autobiography. She said her only crime was loyal service and following orders. Where have I heard that before? Anyhow, after her departure, the White House persuaded Ruckel's House to return to the EPA to restore uh, stability. Ruckel's House, who came back to EPA to run it, a Republican, said the damage had been done to morale. There was fear in the agency. I told them we were going to respect science and the scientific method again. I told them we were going to carry out the mission of the agency. Once they saw that their work was going to be respected, in effect, they had their assignments back. They had their jobs back. That calmed them down. She died of cancer at the age of 62. And, uh, but, you know, let's talk about Gorsuch. You know, not his mother, but him. Uh, this is a guy who apparently, uh, you know, he wrote a book trashing the whole concept of death with dignity. He calls it assisted suicide uh, throughout his book. And uh, death with dignity is the law in several states now that, that if you are within six months of dying, uh, if you are in pain, and if uh, two physicians sign off, I, I believe, uh, as I recall, I may, I may be wrong in some of these details, but it's close to this, uh, but I'm pretty sure as two physicians have to sign off that you are in fact dying, then one of them can prescribe to you uh, a dose of barbiturates, it's a little bottle, you know, an ounce or so of orange colored, orange flavored drink. And it's basically an overdose of, you know, one of the barbiturates, phenobarbital, presumably. So people take it, they drink it and they fall asleep and they die in their sleep. And the doctor doesn't even have to be around. I mean, he just wrote the prescription. And in fact, when I was in Oregon, this was being debated in Oregon. And, you know, this whole issue of death with dignity it passed when we lived in Oregon, when we were doing doing this show from, from Portland. And I had all these people calling who had been through this. Washington State recently picked it up. I think California might have. I'm not sure. I know it was a ballot initiative. I'm not sure if it passed. Um, and there are other states that are looking at it. And, and, and it's just, you know, it's a not unreasonable thing, in my opinion. But, you know, it raises the question is, is it, it, you know, it, in fact, it raises a number of questions. But, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is death with dignity respect for all life? 
or is it dissing life? So, you know, I mean, from the Catholic point of view, it's dissing life. That the, you know, the Catholic Church is very, very opposed to the death with dignity laws. They consider a physician assisted suicide, apparently so does Gorsuch, which, and, and his book and his decisions on the, or his writings on, on this, oh yeah, it's legal in California, Colorado, Oregon, Vermont, Montana, and Washington State. And, and uh, you know, presumably he's applying that same standard to uh, women who are pregnant. Which means, you know, are we going to see Roe v. Wade overturned? So, what should be the the uh, the, the Democrats' strategy on this? I, I you know, I, I find this this fascinating. On the one hand, you know, it, it, Donald Trump was elected, arguably. I mean, you know, you've always got to throw in the caveat. You know, he he, the majority of Americans didn't want Donald Trump, and if if Chris Kobach and his buddies, you know, hadn't suppressed the vote in so many states and, and, and you know, all, the, all these efforts by various Republican groups to suppress the vote, particularly interstate cross-check, it's extremely unlikely, in my opinion, that Donald Trump would be president. Or, for that matter, that the Senate would be in Republican hands. But that's, you know, that's where we're at. And, and you know, the official story that we're all living by is that, you know, Donald Trump and the Republicans in the Senate... Uh, one fair and square, and so he gets to have his nominee. But that was sort of the case. Well, it wasn't sort of the case. I mean, wasn't that the case with President Obama? Didn't he win the previous election fair and square? What happened to Merrick Garland? So I, I don't know how many days it's been. I haven't sat down and done the math on this. And, I, you know, maybe maybe one of you wants to or uh, somebody in our chat room can, you know, pop it up. But the number of days it has been from the day that Scalia died last February uh, until today or yesterday, you know, when, when this announcement was made. That what, let's say it's 330 days. Maybe the Democrats should just say, come back in 330 days or whatever the number of days is. You know, it's a little less than a year. So Chuck Schumer is speaking right now. You want to pick that up? Let, let, let's hear what Chuck Schumer has to say. He's, he's going to be weighing the decision. <laughs> leftover remarks from yesterday. Oh, maybe. <laughs> okay, come on, Chuck. Get with Madam it. Madam President, I rise today on a matter of great importance to everyone in this body and everyone in America, the future of the Supreme Court. Last night, the President nominated Judge Neil Gorsuch. We in the Senate have a constitutional duty to examine his record robustly, exhaustively, and comprehensively, and then advise and consent if we see fit. We have a responsibility to reject if we do not. You notice that if we, we see We Democrats fit? will insist on a rigorous but fair process. There will be 60 votes for confirmation. Any one member can require it. Many Democrats already have. And it is the right thing to do. On a subject as important as a Supreme Court nomination, bipartisan support should be a prerequisite. It should be essential. That's what 60 votes does. This is nothing new. It was a bar met by each of President Obama's nominations. In my mind, 60 votes is the appropriate way to go, whether there is a Democratic president or Republican president. Democratic Senate or Republican Senate. Mr. President, Madam President, because a 60-vote threshold is essential, those who say at the end of this process there are only two possible results, that the Senate will confirm this nominee or the Republicans will use the nuclear option to change the rules of the Senate, are dead wrong. That is a false choice. If this nominee cannot meet the same standard that Republicans insisted upon for President Obama's Supreme Court nominees, 60 votes in the Senate, then the problem lies not with the Senate, but with the nominee. The answer should not be to change the rules of the Senate, but to change the nominee to someone who can earn 60 votes. 60 votes produces a mainstream candidate. There you go. And the so, need for a main... That, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. 
So that was, you know, that's Chuck Schumer. I mean, literally, as we speak, uh, of course, he's a Democrat and he's talking back to the Republicans. So it didn't get picked up by any of the other television networks. <laughs> it's, I'm looking here at CNN and MSNBC. No, no, no. No, we don't need to talk about that stuff. But this is Chuck Schumer laying down the gauntlet saying, you know, we're filibustering this thing. And you guys are, you're going to have to convince eight, eight Democrats to vote with you. Good luck. Now, there's a few, uh, you know, who, who are going to go along. I mean, you know, uh, Joe Manchin, he's, he's, his state was, was won overwhelmingly by both Trump and Romney. So he's kind of, you know, caught in the middle. He's, he's going along. Uh, there's probably a few other Democrats, but can they get eight? I'm skeptical. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And let's not forget, back in 2016, John McCain said that if Hillary Clinton became president, he would suggest that the Senate block her nominees for four years.